Welcome everyone to the Firing the Man podcast. On today's episode, we have the pleasure of interviewing Chelsea Cohen, the co-founder of So Stocked. Chelsea started out as an Amazon seller in 2014 and has been featured on stages and podcasts all around the world, teaching people how to solve their inventory management problems. If you have listened to the Firing the Man podcast in the last six months, you've probably heard Ken and I talking a lot about So Stocked, which is an inventory management system that has helped us step up our inventory game and be more profitable. If you haven't heard us talk about So Stocked, we would like to update you with a short screenplay that details our history with this software, which we have elected to do law and order style. March 2019. David and Ken attend the Prosper Show in Las Vegas. During the show, they meet with several software providers, one of which is SoStocked. David mentions to Ken that they have no need for an inventory management software because after spending eight years in financial consulting and achieving a CPA and CFA, he is an Excel guru and his inventory management spreadsheet would outperform any software on the market. January 2020. David and Ken embark on a strategic initiative to start selling in Amazon UK and Amazon Germany. David's Nimbus 2000 of inventory management spreadsheets starts to become more complicated. What started out as an automated spreadsheet now involves a few manual steps. David has troubles handing off inventory management to other members of his team as he is the only one that understands his spreadsheet. July 2020. The Amazon FBA program implements restock limits, giving nearly every third party seller a black eye. One of Ken and David's brands that typically carried about 15,000 units of inventory is capped at 5,000 units. September 2020. David is sitting at a Starbucks in Benton, Kentucky. Instead of spending Labor Day with his family, he is trying to determine how to combat these inventory storage limits. During this analysis, he realizes that his company will go out of business in three months unless he's able to increase his inventory storage limits. His chest tightens and he feels all of the symptoms of a panic attack. He opens his Facebook app to take a break and sees an advertisement for So Stocked, the solution to inventory storage limits. He determines he has nothing to lose and signs up. October 2020. David falls in love with this new inventory management system as it prioritizes shipments based on sales velocity leading to an increased sell-through rate in IPI. Inventory storage limits start to increase and the company does not go bankrupt. Fast forward to today. We use So Stocked on all three of our portfolio companies. David put his inventory spreadsheet in the penalty box and is using So Stocked on a daily basis. Inventory management has gone from a 25 hour per week task to five hours per week task. All right, to wrap up this short screenplay, uh, we hope that this illustrates how excited we are to have Chelsea Cohen on the podcast. So welcome to the show. Yes, thank you guys so much. I love that. When I uh, heard you guys were going to do that, I got really excited because I think that's, uh, <laughs> I get to be on my own Law & Order show. So <laughs> who doesn't Absol- love that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, just to start off the interview, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to co-founding So Stocked? Sure. Um, so I started selling on Amazon in 2014. And uh, as a seller, as the years went by, started feeling kind of the margin pressure and the kind of slow creep of losing ground in terms of profitability. And um, 2018 started looking at kind of the bottom line and we had stocked out uh, a month here, a couple of weeks there. And so inventory seemed to be the thing that we could really start to control a little bit more because we were doing expensive air shipments to kind of uh, get the inventory in, had to re-rank the product and um, just all of those tiny things that start to add up and uh, start looking around for inventory software, started trying things out and nothing seemed to really work. I uh, come from, you know, I have a little bit of an accounting background as well. I'm not a CPA, but did do some accounting uh, for about four years. I was an account executive at a financial management firm. So the numbers had to really make sense to me. And these systems didn't tell you the formula. They even sometimes went so far as to say that they had these, you know, really smart people that were creating these formulas. And it's like kind of this feel of, you don't need to know, we're just gonna give you this magic number and you're gonna trust it. And so started asking around, 
to different people in masterminds I was a part of, what are you using? And over and over got back. We tried everything, nothing works. We're back to spreadsheets and spreadsheets seem to be the best alternative to anything that was out there. So as an entrepreneur, that kind of uh, created a light bulb moment of if spreadsheets can do this, then why is no software doing it the right way? And that was kind of the impetus of So Stocked. Nice. Um, yeah, definitely happy to have you on the show, Chelsea. We 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 love So Stock. We've been using it for uh, a while now, and it's really really helped our business. So, um, you know, in your journey with So Stocked, and and it's, you've been selling for quite a while now, and so you've probably talked with hundreds or even thousands of sellers. What are some of the common pitfalls that that sellers are falling into in terms of inventory management? Mm -hmm, sure. Um, I would say kind of some of the biggest things are not having a good system. If you are using a spreadsheet, you have to constantly kind of be starting from scratch and updating that. And so just not having, you know, a good system, it creates what I call order procrastination. People don't have their data all together. They get busy with other things. They don't know their reorder point. And they just, some of them just hate inventory. They hate the process. And so it leads to, you know, order procrastination, which can lead to stockouts as well, because it's kind of the last thing that you have in mind. And then simply just not being aware of the, it's like a disconnect between marketing and inventory. And so if you don't have your marketing plans folded up into your inventory plan, that in itself can lead to stockouts as well. So those are kind of some of the main recurring problems that I've seen talking to uh, so many sellers. You, you know, it's interesting that you, you mentioned like the, the procrastination of ordering, you know, we're in the business of selling inventory. Um, we could have the best PPC management team, but if we don't have inventory to um, advertise, then we don't have a business. And, and so, yeah, it's definitely something that, that we've seen in our business and, you know, just little stuff like tracking lead times. You know, we had assumed a, like a 90 day lead time and then we started tracking it and it was like, oh no, we're like somewhere between 120 and 150. And if we're mm -hmm. making decisions based on this 90 day finger in the wind estimate, then we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. And so, yeah, I heard you mention stockouts a lot and, and just want to reiterate that to our listeners is you're in the business of selling inventory. So doggone yeah. it, pay, pay attention to it. So as you heard in our screenplay, um, the inventory storage limits were a huge part of our 2021 and yeah. honestly caused a lot of stress. And so I want to, I want to dive into like the day that yeah. you found out about them because SoStock turned around a solution very quickly. Yeah. Um, and so like, tell me about that day. Like what was your initial reaction? Yeah, so we follow a lot of Amazon news. We actually put a, a newsletter out, um, just a five bullet newsletter. And so our team is constantly going through uh, probably over a thousand articles a month to be able to find the information. So when something comes out, uh, from Amazon, we get an alert right away and we are kind of up on that. So emails and things like that came out and they gave a warning for the, what we referred to as the inventory performance index limits, uh, also, you know, known as the ASIN type limits. And that was kind of first and foremost, every single ASIN had a, a limitation rather than the entire catalog, which is what restock limits became. But because we're so kind of in tune with that, as well as being uh, sellers and being in the community, we were very quickly able to see that Amazon gave a deadline to when this was going to happen. And so we got some advance notice. We're able to look and pull those numbers and build a solution as quickly as possible. We kind of, you know, diverted everything to that uh, restock limits. The storage type restock limits was a different story because there was no warning. It was immediate, it was right away, and uh, everyone was kind of, first we, we all celebrated with, oh, this is great, this is gonna be awesome. And then we saw that our limits collapsed and that we had a bunch of uh, inventory that was, you know, everyone has stale inventory and that became a huge blocker. And so we had no warning and no data. Amazon didn't give us any of that data and still doesn't give us the actual restock limits data. Um, so again, we were forced to, to create a solution for that because you know there wasn't one. 
Yeah, ab- absolutely. I, I, you know, as we were trying to make sense of it, I remember one of your newsletters that you sent mm-hmm. out talking about like very simply breaking it down. Like Amazon makes money on FBA fees. And yeah. the more times you can sell through a product, the more FBA fees they generate. Mm-hmm. And so we were like laser focused on restocking our high sell through rate items. And we're doing daily shipments with our 3PL mm-hmm. and just the ability to like prioritize based on velocity helped us dig out of that hole. Um, Cause like two years prior, the IPI was like this credit score that had no implications. It was just yeah. like <laughs> a number. We didn't, mm-hmm. I'd like look at it, but I didn't measure it or monitor it really. And yeah. um, now all of a sudden it matters. And yeah, yeah. Um, no yeah. one had heard of it. No one heard of it until that point, except for the people who just, uh, a lot of wholesalers or people who had, you know, oversized products, they knew about it because they were so close to that line. And I think a lot of people in private label really didn't have to because we didn't skate that line. And then they also raised the threshold so that a lot more people fell in that range than before. It was like 350. They brought it up to like 500. I think it's about 400, 450 right now. But that change also threw a lot of people into a lot of turmoil. So, um, Chelsea, as we're talking inventory management, uh, you know, I, I think back to, you know, three years ago and my description of Amazon's inventory management is like an accordion. It's just like constantly expanding and contracting based on what's best for Amazon. Right. And so it's mm-hmm. it's kind of the sellers. We're, we're kind of reacting to what Amazon is allowing us to do. And so, you know, uh, in the last couple of years, it was like it went from like, you know, shipping mass containers in to oh, it's, um, you know, just in time inventory. And then it was inventory restrictions. And now they've, as of, I think a couple of months ago, they pretty much unlocked most of our accounts now. And so we shipped in a couple of containers and, uh, here recently and last, I think it was last week or the week before they, Amazon sent out something that they're going to have a new fee or, or they have introduced a new storage limit, um, fee for inventory aged between 271 and 365. So this yeah. is kind of a, a new thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what do you recommend the sellers do to kind of manage that and make sure we're not paying too much for that? Yeah. So, um, there is an aged inventory report. <clears throat> and, um, so first and foremost, paying attention to when, when your inventory is getting kind of close to that mark. And it, this is actually kind of the other side of something I call inventory minded marketing. The, you know, the, the one side and how that concept started was just talking to so many sellers on, you know, why do you stock out and just seeing clients who I had an eight figure seller as a client who ran a a mother's day sale where, you know, we're in May right now looking at mother's day, ran a mother's day sale, 20% off coupon. And then by father's day, which is the next month, was canceling all his lightning deals, um, pumping the brakes, stocking out essentially. So that sale threw him into a stock out. And so uh, being able to put your marketing plans into your inventory plans becomes important. But on the other side of that, kind of to your point of uh, aging inventory is that the inventory team has to be more proactive. Oftentimes they see that role as a very kind of not necessarily passive role, but reactive role, reactive to what marketing is doing. And so creating a system where you've got, you know, an an aged inventory report, you've got a slow seller report, which would be kind of a a range of, let's say for a specific business between five and 20 units a day in terms of sales velocity, how, you know, it's not necessarily a dud product, but it's really kind of headed in the wrong direction. So that report kind of informs people that, hey, if you don't pick this product up, it's going to become a problem down the road. Liquidation report would be, say, anything, you know, below five units a day or whatever it is for your business. And then an overstock report, which is simply, you know, do you have over 90 days worth of inventory? And those reports would essentially be something that you'd send to the marketing team and they have to be responsible for creating a plan to actually market that rather than just focusing on the best sellers. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Ha- having a system in place to, to kind of deal with every step of the, even, you know, of your inventory, of your life cycle, of your inventory. Um, yeah. I think that that's crucial to have that system in place. One, one quick follow-up question. Now I know in so stocked in the software, you know, once, once your account's set up and you plug in all of your numbers and your lead times and all this, 
this is all calculated for you. Um, but my question is, I guess at a high level, something that we've tried to figure out is kind of that sweet spot of um, getting enough inventory in mm -hmm. to where we're not limiting ourselves for regional sales, yeah, but yet right. we're not, we, but we don't have too much. So what is at a, I guess at a high level, can you, do you have any data to point to where when your inventory is say, say you have more than 60 days or 90 days or 120, your coverage covering enough uh, regional centers where you're capturing all of the sales? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we haven't done like a full analysis, but um, like 30 days is kind of the bare minimum, 30 days worth of inventory more. And it, it kind of got a little bit hairy for people with restock limits, but 45 days is of course safer. So having um, let's say 45 days. And then if you want to, you know, no more than 90 days, you're transferring in every 45 days or so um, tends to be a good sweet spot. But I would say, you know, we're, we find that going below 30 days worth of inventory can tend to be a problem. And that's actually, you know, kind of the, the numbers nerd in me wants to eventually get to the point where we're actually pulling, you can actually see where your inventory is across across those uh, different locations and start to look at uh, maybe doing some case studies down the road on 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 that particular aspect of um, of inventory and what they call a geo ranking. OK, so so just to recap, kind of that 45 to 90 is kind of what you're what you're seeing right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I don't think you, ha you need to have more than 90, but 45 would be kind of what we call buffer stock. That's, you know, when we get to 45 inventory should be arriving and then topping back up to, let's say, 90 or 120, depending on your particular business. I've wanted to ask you that question for like two months, so I'm glad, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ken, I'm glad you beat me to it. Um, and just to kind of get we've been trying to figure out that sweet spot in our own business. Yeah. Um, helium 10 came out with a heat map tool. Mm -hmm. Um, and it tells you what warehouses your stuff's in, but it, it's hard to make any decisions. And so we looked at, I spent a couple hours on it a couple weeks ago, looking at, okay, this group of products, we have 120 days of inventory, 90, yeah. 60, and where are they geographically spread? And right. the only conclusion that I could come up with was, once, when you send in like 90 days of inventory, it takes some time for that disbursement to happen. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not immediate. And so like for, mm -hmm. like if we had two identical products that both had 120 days of inventory, it really mattered when we sent them in. Um, uh -huh. but yeah. anyway, it's nice to like actually be able to have the tools to look at that, um, uh -huh. and know how many days of inventory you have. So, yeah. um, anyway, so, um, you know, going back to 2021, if I were to think of like the two challenging spots, one would have been mm -hmm. inventory storage limits. The second would have been logistics. Yeah. And uh, we were trading emails but before this podcast and uh, you were talking about logistics flexibility. And mm -hmm. so can we dive into that? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Logistics flexibilities. This is something that uh, sellers are starting to do. And uh, I've talked about it in various different settings. And we actually had someone who said, as soon as they implemented this, they, they haven't had a stock out. And it does take some additional resources um, in terms of cash flow. But the, the concept is that you are creating kind of a plan A, B, C, and D. And would start with, if you're ordering a container uh, and that container gets stuck at the port, then you tend to be kind of uh, in a pickle. And I ask people when I hear they stock out, I ask them, why did you stock out? And it's generally, uh, you know, everything is stuck on a boat somewhere. Amazon hasn't checked it in for six weeks. And it's generally, there's someone that you gave all your stuff to, and then they didn't do what you expected them to do. And so there's kind of this golden rule, don't let anyone have all your stuff or don't put all your eggs in one basket. So if you're ordering a container load, the idea would be to order, let's say a container load plus a month or plus two months and hold that extra inventory at your supplier's warehouse. We talked about just in time inventory. This would be referred to as just in case inventory, which is what everyone has had to shift to because the supply chain has been so unreliable. Um, so you have this extra inventory and that tends to put a strain on your cash flow. So what you can tend to do is uh, negotiate 
for one, your supplier doesn't tend to uh, always charge you for that. So you might be able to get them not to charge you for storage fees for let's say three months or so. Um, so that you're not paying storage fees on that, you might have to pay the 30% down or whatever your terms are. But when you go to pay that final payment, you can usually negotiate that you only pay the final payment on what actually ships. So you'll pay the final payment for your container. They'll hold that inventory. You'll cross your fingers and hope that your boat arrives on time. If it doesn't though, you still have that inventory sitting there that you can air freight over if you absolutely need to. So you only incur that cost if that's absolutely necessary. And then of course, the idea would be you carry that on to your 3PL with your uh, you know, full truckload, less than truckload, and then having that small parcel delivery um, option available with inventory held at your 3PL. So that kind of creates flexibility on um, you know, the, the origin side as well as locally. And then last piece would be uh, having a third party fulfillment to do FBM. So kind of those, those different pieces to be able to really uh, rebound from anything that might happen. I really like that. And if I think back to some of the um, issues that we had last year, it was because we had our eggs in one basket um, where yeah. we were re relying on a container and it would show up six weeks late and would be stuck in port. And, and I really, really like that option. Um, as a follow on question, you know, the 3PL industry had saw a boom this year. Um, yeah. and we, we signed up with a couple 3PLs and we're kind of trickling in inventory with daily or weekly shipments. When I look at costs, boy, does that add a lot of costs, right? You've got yeah. your in inbound fees, your outbound fees, um, and that eats away at margin. So I really mm -hmm. like sending directly to Amazon. However, um, a stock out's a stock out and maybe having some backup inventory at a 3PL is, you know, just good business hygiene, right? Yeah. Um, do you, do you think that like 3PLs and this method of like backup inventory is here to stay? Um, I think for some businesses it is, businesses it is. I think that some businesses are kind of, they're, they're more used to shooting from the hip. I think they'll get into some trouble by doing that. But, um, you know, we, the, the supply chain is still very, very volatile. I don't know if it will ever uh, in the next, say, five years, get back to what we were used to it being. And um, I think we're kind of forced to keep at least some. We've, we've seen the detriment of not having kind of backup plans available. So uh, I think that there is going to be, uh, at least for the next, like, say, five years, most people are going to keep some sort of a 3PL. Yeah, I I like that um, term just in case. Uh, so so now we have just in time and just in case. So like those are like Plan A, Plan B, Plan C. So that's really good. Um, and so Chelsea, I, I think um, you have a very unique perspective in terms of you know uh, you know operating um, a software platform for sellers. And so you get to interact with lots of different sellers all of the time. And yeah. so in, in the finance world, um, I think there's a saying called, what is the smart money doing? And yeah. so in the seller's world with, with your insights of seeing and, and interacting with so many sellers, what are some of the smart sellers doing other than, you know, what we talked about with the logistics flexibility, what are, mm. what are some of the other sellers doing to kind of beat out their competition in say 2022? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do talk to a lot of sellers. I also talk to aggregators as well. And so kind of one of those things is what are aggregators doing? What are the smart aggregators doing? Cause we know some aggregators are, are, are what they're doing is going bankrupt. So <laughs> what are the, what are the aggregators that are actually operators doing? You know, the ones that are swallowing up the ones that are going bankrupt and, um, you know, really kind of diving into the profitability side of things. See, I like to say, you know, you make or lose money before your inventory even checks in. And so really starting to, to put a lot of time and attention on the operation side. We're no longer, you know, we have, we have bull and bear markets. It's kind of like that type of thing where money was, was flowing. I mean, everyone talks about increasing their margins, talked about scaling, um, but money was more free flowing before 2020. Now the margins are a lot more narrow for various different reasons and supply chain and the, you know, that side of things being, being a major part of that. So the smart sellers are starting to really put systems in place for operations and really starting to look at 
how is it possible to recover some of the profit and you know in, increase your your profit margin on the operations side i call it profit optimization across the supply chain and not a lot of people are talking about it not enough people are talking about it um, and i don't think that people feel like they can do anything about the shipping costs about the 3pl costs it's just kind of something that they're eating but there are ways to optimize if you get smart about it I, I like that. And, and if it's all right with you, I'm going to mention a couple levers that we've been pulling in our business to kind of find some, unlock some margin. Um, so uh, first first and foremost, we're, we're very attentive to FBA fees. We run Gatita for refunds, and that's a nice little nugget of refunds every month. Um, we've been dialing our PPC costs back. Um, in 2021, we dialed them back about 70% and have seen an uptick in organic sales, which has been nice. We have most recently just started shipping directly to Amazon and cutting the 3PL out. Um, so there's a little bit of margin enhancement there. Um, we've been looking at long-term storage fees and trying to put in a process where it's it's the 15th of the month and, oh no, we, we're gonna get hit with this big charge. What should we do? We, we've tried to like start looking earlier, like two months before and either deeply discounting or running coupons. Um, so those are, those are some of the systems that we've been putting into play, but I'm curious, like, are there any other levers that we should be thinking about? Yeah. The, uh, saying size matters kind of uh. comes into play here. Uh, especially if you're, you've got three PLs, but you know, even if you just ship at all, so uh, there's a lot of things that Amazon is doing to kind of encourage people to reduce their packaging size. And that's kind of the foundation of where everything starts. Not everybody can do that, but if you can do that, you know, there's dimensional weight fees, which came out in January, which is not just looking at how much does your thing, how much does your, your product weigh, but how much does it weigh versus how big is it? Because we're gonna charge you as if it weighs more, if it is big. So we've got, People who are selling pillows, for example, I have a friend who who sells a large product and their fees went up, um, fulfillment fees increased by 94% overnight because of this new change in how Amazon is calculating some of these larger products. So that becomes kind of the first step is, is there a way to start to reduce the size of your product? Can you vacuum seal it? Can you, you know, if it's silicone, can you fold it up if you've got a, uh, you know, a face cream, can you put it in a smaller container? Those types of things. We had, I have a friend who sells sunglasses and instead of this big bulky case changed to um, kind of a smaller, a smaller sleeve and was able to significantly reduce the fulfillment fees on that product. But then of course there's kind of the, the ripple effect. Um, when you have a smaller product, you can fit more into a, a container and a carton and a pallet and reduce your fees kind of all across the board. So you kind of can see, and we actually made um, a tool for that called a, a carton, a master carton calculator to figure out what is that, that optimum sweet spot of, of, you know, maximizing your units per carton, units per pallet, what, and essentially if you can maximize that, you can minimize um, the number of cartons. If you can reduce the number of of cartons then you're reducing the fees pallet fees storage fees and all of that okay i i really like that where can that where can people find that calculator mm -hmm. yeah um if you go to sostock.com forward slash tools they uh we have a bunch of tools there we have the fba calculator which does factor in the dimensional weight fees so if you haven't checked your product to see if it's affected you can look at that and then the carton carton pallet calculator um, is on there too. And the way that, that works, there is a, there is a free tool um, online that, and those are free tools. There is a free tool online con called on pallet, which takes your current is on pallet.com takes your current um, carton size and it'll give you the optimum pallet dimensions, but, and configuration. But what our tool does is it looks at the unit size and the pallet size and then kind of works it backwards to figure out what your carton size should optimally be to fit as many, you know, units per carton and then um, cartons per pallet. Because we've had people run their current stuff through and usually suppliers are the ones that create the boxes. And we've had people kind of do that assessment and their current configuration is only allowing them to store, say, you know, less than 50% 
sometimes, less than 50% actual palette volume. So if you reconfigure that, you can reduce your palettes, let's say by half. Very, very nice. That makes, I'm, I'm uh, to all of our listeners that are driving, uh, I will post a link to that in the show notes. Um, but um, yeah, I'm excited to check that out uh, for yeah. our own brains that, that we're running internally. So, all right. So let's talk supply chain profitability. Did we yeah. just kind of talk about that? <laughs> we we kind of <laughs> did. We didn't get yeah. into kind of like um, the container side of things, but it's essentially the supply chain profitability has to do with like, how are you packaging your stuff? Are you, you know, how are you packing your cartons, your pallets, your containers? Uh, if you can reduce the size of things, there's actually a tool called um, peertopeer.com forward slash load calc. And it's peer as in, you know, like a, a peer, like a doc, peer, the number two, peer.com forward slash load calc as in calculator. And that will help you to uh, essentially you plug in the dimensions and the number of cartons that you have, and it'll optimize that, that container. It'll give you a container map and that container map um, is something that you could then give to your freight forwarder. If you're working with a freight forwarder who, you know, is influential enough to be able to kind of make that happen, they'll give you that, you'll give them that map, but then you want to give your 3PL the map on the other side so that they can optimize the unloading of it too and save on, on labor costs. So it's kind of all of these incremental things that start to really make an impact on your bottom line. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so just to kind of recap this, this whole conversation, if, if somebody was thinking to themselves, I, I have not thought about supply chain profitability and I ought to, just to kind of recap, we would, we would first start with, we'd go to sostock.com slash tools, and we would look at the individual units that would go inside of a carton. Yeah. Um, and, and then the next step would be to look at cartons on a pallet mm -hmm. and then look at pallets in a container. Is that kind of the process that, that you would suggest following? Yes. So um, the the tool that we have, it look, it does your cartons and your pallet configuration. So you put in your units and which pallet you have um, and some of your, your costs as well. And it'll spit out your, your pack list in terms of, you know, this is what your cartons should look like and this is what your pallets should look like. You can send that pack list to your supplier and you may get some of that pushback. I've had people write to me and say, my supplier is suggesting this instead. Wouldn't this be the same? And I've actually sat there and done the math on paper and said, no, this is going to cost you the same as what you're paying now. This is absolutely not the same, even though it sounds like it's the same. So you kind of, you know, you have to navigate the pushback and ask them, why are you not necessarily willing to make this, this change? And sometimes it's because they would have to incorrect your cost. So you can just say, okay, well, it's going to save me more than what I would pay per carton so pay that extra cost maybe it's an extra five cents or something like that per carton but you're going to save you know 40. Um, incur that extra cost and then um, it'll give you that the uh, breakdown of what are you going to be saving when you make this change and uh, that that always helps to kind of help make you want to go through the kind of the pain of having to to make those changes and then once you have that, you would go to load, you know, peer to peer.com slash load calc and push your, um, the, the cart or the, the container side of things. And, you know, you have to work with your 3PL in terms of whether it makes sense to load pallets or to, uh, to load, uh, what's called floor loading, floor loading. You can fit more, more, can, more cartons into that pallet or into that container. And, but then you're going to be paying on the other side palletizing fees. So, but usually if you can fit more into a, a ten thousand uh, dollar container, it, it probably makes more sense not to have those pallets and just to pay the palletizing fees on the other side. Yeah, that's some some really good uh, high level strategy on on maximizing the logistics. You know, um, as I think about you know, you know, a few years ago when we we're paying. 3,000, 4,000 container to, to, you know, this past Q4, we were paying 20 or 25 per container, you know, to get ahead, you know, these, this method that you just talked about, like from, from the product all the way up to unloading, whether you unload cartons or pallets, like doing all those calculations is really going to impact the bottom line. So mm -hmm. really yeah, glad. And that's, 
that's like some stuff that I get, I really nerd out on that stuff. And that's kind of the direction that we're headed with SoStock is, you know, how do we take what, what was the foundation, which was, you know, we started out with in my own business margin, like profitability and inventory was the, the obvious first choice, but my goal has always been, how do we increase profit margin? And so getting those calculations into the software is kind of one of those next frontiers that we are planning to head down is how do we actually get true landed cost, not estimated landed cost, and per shipment, per SKU, and then profitability as you continue to incur storage fees because every single month your SKUs are less and less profitable. That's really cool. I, <clears throat> yeah, I'm excited to see that built, built into the software. So, yeah. um, well, cool. So, so Telsey, um, for all the listeners, um, and that includes myself, probably mm-hmm. three or four years ago that were using spread that are, are still using spreadsheets for inventory. What, what is your message to those sellers? Um, if you plan on scaling your business at all, uh, moving outside of spreadsheets and getting into a system that you can pass on. Cause usually it's one person, like as in with your scenario, there's one person who has the keys to the kingdom in terms of the spreadsheet and um, you know, you're not passing that on. So if there is more time that's more valuably spent in other things, if you can save, you know, if someone said, you know, that you're really, really busy. And if you could save an extra 10 hours a week or, you know, or 10 hours a month or whatever it is for you by automating something, we are all obsessed with automating until it comes to our inventory spreadsheets, which I think is funny, but that's kind of like, if you're going to, to expand and to grow, you need to start looking at a system that actually works in an automated way. I think one thing that that comes into play here for some listeners, not all listeners, but um, is just because you can build an awesome spreadsheet doesn't mean you should. And I, you know, a painter has a canvas. Uh, someone that does, you know, uh, sculptures, they have, you know, wood or clay or whatever. Yeah. There are certain people that their brain is organized into rows and columns and they express their art form through Microsoft Excel. And I am one of those people. (laughs) And, you know, in my opinion, the world runs off of Microsoft Excel and the internal combustion engine. You eliminate (laughs) those things, the world shuts down. Yeah. Um, But that's, we ran into that exact problem where it was, um, you know, it had VBA, it had macros, it had, it was a, it was a, not to brag, it was a pretty kick-ass spreadsheet. Um, yeah. But I, I, I kind of handcuffed myself to not being able to hand it off to anybody. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, and so, so take it to our listeners. Take it from a person that was already pretty good at Excel. Um, yeah. This has been wonderful. And you know, with SoStock, we can export reports, and I can do Excel <laughs> gymnastics until I'm blue in the face, and yeah. and still get that, you know get that little mm-hmm. rush of expressing yeah. my art form. Mm-hmm. But uh, exactly. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, yeah, we have a term um, and, and this applies also to those those products, which we want to, you know, get to the point of identifying what products are weighing your profitability down. Um, but the same applies here. There's a term. It's actually a writing term and it's kill your darlings. These these things that we're obsessed with, it's, you know, in writing, it's the, the character that you love, but you doesn't serve the story. And that's kind of where spreadsheets and and dud products and, and those types of things. You put all this attention and love into it, but if it's no longer serving, you know, your story, your business, then you have to eventually, you know, kill your darlings. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, all right. Uh, well, before we get to the fire round, all of our listeners that haven't heard about so stocked, um, and want to learn more, where can they go? Sure. Um, you can go to sostocks.com. We have uh, demos that we do. We do live live demos. You can always check out a live demo. We have a short demo video as well. And then, um, you know, just learn about the free tools that we have. If you're not quite at the point, we have a lot of free tools at sostock.com forward slash tools. And then if you're just interested in connecting with me um, on, you know, Facebook and uh, in Instagram or on Instagram, you can go to sostock.com forward slash connect and, you know, shoot me a message if you're going to friend me on Facebook because I get a lot of messages. So let me know who you are and then I'll uh, accept your, your friend request. Awesome. Definitely. Definitely. And to our <clears throat> listeners, I unsubscribe from just about every newsletter. 
except yours. I love I I love your newsletter, so keep it up. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and that's sostock.com forward slash headlines. Because yeah, we we do like I said, we go through a lot of a lot of data, and then I personally go through uh, those those pieces that are selected. And you know, it's really it's all about what's what's relevant, what's actually actionable and relevant to to people, because we don't have a lot of time to to read a bunch of newsletters. Definitely. Nice. Definitely. Yeah, Our- definitely second that. Um, those are yeah, pretty pretty highly relevant and um, yeah, very very quick and scanning and and get right to the point. Those are my favorite kind. So, um, all right, Chelsea, are you ready for the fire round? I am. Awesome. Uh, what is your favorite book? Uh, yeah, this was a hard one because um, I'm you know a writer as well, but. Uh, I actually, it's interesting. I found myself gravitating more towards non-fiction. I really like Malcolm Gladwell books. I don't know if you are familiar with Malcolm Gladwell, The Tipping Point, which is about, you know, how how do trends start? Uh, Blink, which is all about first impressions and uh, Outliers is another favorite. You know, what are those, those weird anomalies? Like, you know, why are certain types of people really good at math? And, you know, and actually what he does is he goes to, um, he studies the data and he finds reasons behind these things that just happen. You know, all oh, these things just are. It just, you know, it just became a trend or, um, you know, this is just a, a cliche that we know. And he finds the data behind it, which is uh, really, really interesting and fun to, to experience. That's awesome. Yeah, someone else recommended Outliers. I'm going to, I'm yeah. putting that on my list. So very cool. Uh, what are your hobbies? Um, I mean, I, I work a lot, but I would say my hobby, uh, is cooking. I, I like cooking. I like chopping vegetables. <laughs> That's like my stress release is chopping. Um, and my husband was one of those Facebook things, you know, talk about your spouse and said, what's, you know, what's your, her favorite thing to do? And he put chopping and I was like, you're right. Chopping is my <laughs> favorite thing. So cooking and chopping, organizing my fridge, you know, I'm, I'm pretty boring that way. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. Uh, chopping vegetables as stress relief. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, what is the one thing that you do not miss about working for the man? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I would say, I mean, inefficiencies, like things that don't make sense and they're done, you know, just because that's the way we do it. But what I really don't miss is just not building something, just knowing that I'm showing up every day and maybe could get an incremental gain, but I'm not really building anything substantial that's mine. That's probably the thing that I don't miss the most is that any time I had a job, I had this angst behind that idea. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Last one. What do you think sets apart successful e-commerce entrepreneurs from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Sure. Um, I mean, number one, I think is persistence and people say this all the time, but it, it truly is. It's persistence, willingness to learn. Um, you know, also I think a lot of people have this fear of success, fear of failure, which are kind of two sides to the same coin. And to me, it's been being okay with knowing that the worst thing that could happen is that you lose everything (laughs) and just being okay with that. You know, I think that that's really what it takes is that, you know, you make that decision because, you know, it, it, the more that you, you move forward and the more that you find uh, successes, you, you tend to feel more confident in your ability to just build it all over again. Awesome. Uh, David, do you want to close out the show? Absolutely. Chelsea, I want to thank you for being a guest on the Firing the Man podcast. And uh, to our listeners, we will post links to everything that we discussed in this uh in this episode. So thank you, Chelsea, and looking forward to staying in touch. Yes. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun.